Ruby, Volume 6, Episode 9, Lost. What happens? The episode begins with Emerald and Mercury being moody and dropping some backstory. After getting grumpy at each other, Tyrion interrupts to be a creepo and tell the kids that he and Watts are gonna leave to do something next volume. Elsewhere, Jean, Ren, Nora, and Saffron are looking for Oscar. Saffron, Ren, and Nora fucks off because Jean hasn't gotten to be the focus yet this volume. He walks into a graveyard, finds a Pyrrha statue, talks to a mysterious red-haired woman, and after five minutes of the show trying to get all the reaction channels to cry over Pyrrha again, the plot decides to finally do something. Except, uh uh-oh, looks like we ran out of time. Oscar's come back all on his own, and we apparently missed an entire existential crisis of his. Jean forces himself to the front of the stage again to overdramatically apologize and announce his plan to get to Atlas by stealing an airship. Crow's a wet blanket, Ruby calls him a smelly loser, and the whole thing finishes with me smashing my skull in to end my suffering. <laughs> That paragraph I just read out should make it clear that this is going to be one of those reviews where it's basically just me being mad for the whole thing. This episode is dumb and annoying, and I don't think I have a single positive thing to say about it. While it's not the worst episode of the show, that distinction still goes to rest and resolutions, it's a close second. So you know what? If you liked this episode, great! Cool, I'm happy for you, and I would suggest maybe watching one of our other videos, but if you'd like to know why I think this episode is a complete shit sandwich and want to see how well I managed to control my blood pressure while reviewing it, then stick around. In a show that's filled with hours of clunky, boring exposition dumps, Emerald and Mercury's conversation here is one of the worst. The two just start going into their motivations and backstory for no reason, other than the script says the audience needs to learn this shit. This could have been a really great opportunity to actually develop these characters. As it is, Mercury can most accurately be described as a gray smirk painted onto some cardboard, and after five years of him being literally worthless, they give him a scene to show us what his character is actually like, and they fuck it up. Just like every other instance of characters telling each other about themselves, Mercury just goes off on this pre-planned monologue detailing his wiki page bullet points. Why write your characters to speak with any sort of, you know, character, when they can all just sound like robots shitting out all the lore you were excited to write up but too lazy to incorporate into the script or plot naturally? And on top of Merc's delivery being as dry as dirt, what he actually has to say is dumb too. He basically says, I'm in the evil team just because. His motivation is literally the script told me to. The writers couldn't even be bothered to give Mercury a reason to exist in the show. Why the fuck is he still here? And not only that, the writers give so little of a shit about Merkster that they decide, let's come up with some excuse so we don't have to give him a semblance. And when I unlocked my semblance, he stole it with his, but I never got it back. Excuse me? This should have been brought up a long ass time ago. Why are we and Emerald only just now learning that his dad could semblance steal? If you're gonna put so little effort into a character, get rid of them. The cast is already stuffed to burst and Smercury is offering literally nothing of value. Him being in the show actively hurts the writing of the other villains as the writers have to constantly try and keep him included. This whole deal with Mercury shittily telling the audience all his backstory is so annoying that I've completely forgot to say anything about Emerald's crap yet. Emerald's writing is so wishy-washy that she feels like multiple characters sharing the same model. There's overconfident, badass, tee-hee, evil Emerald, and then there's boo-hoo, life is scary and hard, nervous and sad all the time Emerald. I realize keeping anything consistent in the show is wildly difficult for the showrunners to actually do for some reason, but I hope they figure out what the fuck angle they're going for with Emerald soon, cause this is getting annoying. All she does for this whole scene is tell us shit we already know to prompt Mercury's monologues. He could be talking to a wall and nothing would change. I couldn't think of a good transition for this, so we're just gonna roll into it. When's Rooster Teeth gonna learn that randomly kicking and punching the air isn't actually training? This looks so stupid, and despite Mercury's constant electric slide throughout the scene, the visuals are so dull that watching my tears fall across my keyboard is more fun to look at. What do these losers do all day? Sit on the floor and kick beams of light? A good set and good direction makes the world feel lived in, like the characters have lives even when the camera's not on them. But for Emerald and Mercury, they only seem to exist when the script needs someone for Tyrion or Hazel to talk to. And despite this whole ass talking head scene where they say so many words, nothing of worth was learned by the audience. All this talking, 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 and we still don't know what Salem actually wants to do. Salem's promised us everything. We win this thing for her, 
will be top dogs in her new world. Win what thing? Is she gonna start a war? New world how? Does she plan on using the relics to do that? Why? How? What does that have to do with the silver eyes? Dialogue matters. When characters talk, there should be a reason for it. But for this scene, the only reason these two say anything at all is because the episode would have been too short otherwise. There's being vague to keep the audience in suspense, and then there's just saying crap without considering how little the audience knows. You need to stop dancing around giving your audience information at some point, and actually let us fucking know what your final boss's goal is. Holy shit, I haven't even gotten to Tyrion yet. All you ever learned was pain and violence, and now you're too afraid to leave it! As if having Mercury point-blank tell us what his backstory is wasn't enough, the writers then have Tyrion explain it to us as well. Why? Why is this part so slow? Are they trying to be poignant? Hey, Rooster Teeth, I'ma tell you a secret. You ready? You don't have to have your characters set up their villainy plans a whole volume early. We don't need Tyrion saying, we're heading off to Atlas, gotta get in Ironwood's way, when that doesn't affect this volume. You don't need to set up next year's plot when you can't even set up this year's plot right. Maybe instead of telling us the synopsis for volume 7 during this episode, you could have hinted at Adam being in town so your main villain of the volume doesn't literally come out of nowhere. I can't believe I've already spent so much time on this episode and I haven't even gotten to the dumb statue yet. This is all my fault. We overreacted. Did John just have his tantrum last episode as an excuse to get him outside to find the statue? Just have the boy go on a walk. You don't need to fabricate a whole new plot element that you're just going to ignore. Did he do something wrong? No, he didn't. We just got some new information and it's going to be a lot harder than we thought. Wow, Jean just like admits that the whole cast are fucking jerks. We have to put some thought into winning now, so we all decided to yell at Oscar and hit him and ostracize him. Ozpin's a villain because Save It The World isn't going to be easy like we thought it was going to be. This is simultaneously super annoying characterization, having the kids acknowledge they've been little shits about this, and also super annoying writing because having Jean admit this changes nothing. They all continue the Ozpin's a villain mantra even after the writers have the kids say, we all overreacted. Why was Saffron even in this scene? She offers the kids some advice and then they just brush it aside and ignore her. Why? Gotta make sure the kids are all the smartest people in the room all the time? Golly, what a good moment for some team building. Except fuck you, Ren and Nora didn't want to bone Pyrrha, so they're not allowed to be sad about her death. We can't have them getting in the way of Jean's fourth big dramatic I'm sad about Pyrrha moment. Gotta give Jean another fucking drama queen scene over that friend who kissed him that one time. Heaven knows Ren and Nora don't give a shit about that bitch. They're downright glad she's dead. Wouldn't want to accidentally give extra screen time to the party members who aren't voiced by the lead writer. Hey guys, do you remember Pyrrha? You were all really sad when she died. Look at all the reaction channels who cried about her. The show was actually doing well that volume, so we're gonna keep bringing Pyrrha up so hopefully you'll remember how invested you were in the plot back then. Do you remember her? Aren't you sad she's dead? Don't you want to cry again? This scene is fucking insulting with how blatantly hard RT is trying to tug at your heartstrings for some cheap, undeserved emotion. Despite the fact that they constantly bring up their beloved dead princess in every fucking volume after her death, they try and pretend seeing this ugly ass statue model should really hit home for us. We haven't seen her since volume three. Except for Jean's training video, and that one time Ruby had a nightmare about her voice, and that one time Ruby had a flashback about her death. And the cringe fest of the song Forever Fall playing in the background is just making the try-hard feel of the scene even worse. Ignoring the fact that this song sounds like shit, it's the hyper on-the-nose lyrics that makes me roll my eyes so hard they do a full rotation in the sockets. Guys, do you remember that Pyrrha was in love? She loved Jean, isn't that tragic? Please care again, please buy our merch. This whole scene is a self felatiating look at the sad, tragic love story we wrote slice of bullshit. So preoccupied with patting themselves on the back for making a bunch of preteens cry back in 2016 that they completely fail to write a deserved emotional conclusion to this three year long edge fest. And since it's not enough to make a shitty song to beat the message over your head with and to have Jean choke back tears again, we have to keep forcing this overdramatic cock down your throat with mysterious red-haired woman, the most unnecessary thing to be in this show. 
but, but, she's got the same voice actress as Pyrrha, and she looks a lot like Pyrrha. Maybe Pyrrha's actually alive, and maybe I'm gonna rip my fingernails off out of sheer boredom, because when we take a second to ignore how bad this whole scene's dialogue is, it really hits home how little effort actually went into this big moment, with the characters standing stock still and barely emoting. TV static has more visual impact than this garbage. Jumping back on topic with mysterious red-haired woman, her existence is literally literally to just be a Pyrrha look-alike to continue this attempt to tug at the viewer's heartstrings. She's not a character. She's nothing. She's just Jen Brown's voice with some red hair. Having the voice of Pyrrha stare dead ass into the camera and tell us why Pyrrha was so great and amazing and perfect is fucking embarrassing. And the way Rooster Teeth pussy out on is this a ghost, or Pyrrha reincarnated, or her mom, or my drugs finally kicking in, is the most insulting part of this whole thing. Mysterious red-haired woman blandly staring into camera with no interesting visuals, talking about Pyrrha's opinions as if she knew what Pyrrha was thinking before she died, just to magically disappear as soon as the rest of Pyrrha's team shows up is the most worthless thing to happen this whole volume. This only happens to give Jean another excuse to cry, and to have all the Pyrrha stands scream about how their waifu might still be alive. Not only was this poorly written and boring to watch, it's just repeating shit that we've already seen before. Remove this scene from the show and it would be an active improvement on the overall product. Why did you- <gasps> How did you not see the statue until you were literally a foot away from it? Get glasses, honey. I'm sorry. Yeah, you better be. Hey, John, this has to stop. Thank goodness someone finally said it. After three years of watching Jean refuse to do anything beyond sulking about Pyrrha, it's about fucking time the show actually had him grow. You did not need to waste three years on Jean being a piss baby to finally have him develop in relation to Pyrrha's death. And like, I get it. Some people struggle with getting over death. That's okay, but Jean's a fictional fucking character. The writers should prioritize the character's development and growth in order to make a satisfying story, even if that may not be realistic. But instead, the writers prioritize having Jean force himself center stage repeatedly for three years while refusing to grow. For dedicating so damn much of your screen time to Jean dealing with loss, you sure as fuck didn't do anything good with all that time. I'm glad Ren says this, so now maybe Jean can get to do literally anything else, because hot damn, his characterization has become more stagnant than pond scum. And hey, maybe next time don't wait three years to pass before you let your character finish their dumbass arc and actually grow. Halfway through writing the script, my computer had a meltdown and froze and I had to do a forced shutdown. If that's not a perfect analogy to me unreasonably losing my shit over this episode, I don't know what is. Four and a half minutes left in the episode and we finally see our protagonist for the first time. And oh goody, we're still yelling at Crow for being drunk. That's not tiring or anything. How did Oscar get into the house? Does he have a key? Did he break in? Why didn't he call someone and let the others know he made it home safe? Why didn't he let Crow in? Also, his new outfit looks simultaneously too busy and boring, which is almost impressive, really. I do like that Dorothy's got ruby boots now, though, so it's not all bad. But hey, let's focus on the important part. The fact that we COMPLETELY MISSED Oscar's whole development. Why spend so long on Mercury telling us unimportant backstory and mysterious red-haired fuck when at least some time should have been dedicated to showing us Oscar coming to terms with being just another one of Ozma's lives? Oscar says, I don't know how much longer I'm going to be... me. But I did some thinking. Why didn't we get to see that? While the show was too busy jerking off to Pyrrha for the millionth time, they completely ignored the main deuterogonist coming to grips with a life where he may not get to stay as himself for much longer, but still decides to join the heroes despite the evil witch lady out to get him. The showrunner's priorities are fucked. I haven't seen a show so incompetently produced since Volume 5's finale. If you're limited on screen time, figure out what the actually important shit is and make sure the audience sees it. Fuck. It's my fault we were all out there in the first place. Bitch, haven't you siphoned enough screen time yet? Did the writers forget that Yang's been bullying Oscar since the train crash and that Crow punched him in the face? The whole group has been assholes to Oscar. Jean is not the only one who should be apologizing. But I guess the showrunners don't care about having the rest of the cast develop emotionally. Why is Ruby so mad that Crow's heading upstairs? The guy's drunk. Let him go sleep it off. Jeez. Whiny little shit. Okay. Let's talk about stealing an airship. 
The fandom has pretty unanimously called this plan pretty dumb, and they're right. And now, don't get me wrong, a wildly difficult but bombastic military base takeover slash stealth mission could be a great way to end a volume. It's anime. We don't need everything to be normal all the time. Here's where they went wrong with steal an airship plan. One, there is no plan part. The kids magically get in the air with no problems. Stealing a military grade aircraft was rendered so simple, Weiss literally does it by herself with no effort. The writers for some reason make the steal the airship part of the plan the least difficult part of the whole operation and it's just like... Do they not understand that stealing the airship could have been plenty for the kids to overcome for the finale? No mech needed. Two, there's no setup for this plan beyond Jean looking at the Pyrrha statue and seeing an airship behind her. That's bad. If the plan to get to Atlas is going to be as outrageous as we become federal criminals and risk our lives getting a military-grade airship, there should be some sort of setup to that. Because otherwise, Jean looks like a dumbass who just decides stealing an airship from a heavily guarded military base is a good idea because... He read the script, I guess. Three, they have not ruled out any other options. Steal from the military was the first idea they propose. Why not just call Winter, send a letter to Ironwood, have one of them give the group clearance? Could they take a boat to Atlas? Could they steal a not military grade airship? Could Weiss summon something and carry the group there? Could they actually have Cordo shut up and listen to the request instead of just screeching at them? Does Crow know any other huntsmen who could help them get there? Maria's eyes are fucking broke. There should be a way for her to get to Atlas to see her doctor. Since they haven't explained why any of these much easier solutions couldn't work, the viewers just stuck asking why aren't they doing this way less stupid thing instead? The kids all act like Crow's Satan for being the only one smart enough to tell Jean that his idea would probably not work and it's fucking aggravating. How am I supposed to side with these kids when they decide, yeah, let's become federal outlaws because the only person over the age of 19 in the group was against it. Crow's the only one behaving reasonably, but uh-oh, he drinks too much. So Ruby has to slam dunk on him even though all that does is make her seem like a dumb brat. Weiss and Ying express how they think it's a bad plan and that's fine, but since Crow doesn't like it, fuck adults! Let's be criminals because we're kids! And I'm not even really exaggerating on that. Ruby's speech is literally, we're young, so we are perfect. I know you're trying to protect us, that you're afraid we can't do it, but right now, I don't really care what you think. Was this shit written by some middle schooler who got mad that their mom took away their Game Boy for the night? Cause that's what it sounds like. Just because you don't have an idea doesn't mean we're out of options. Yeah, and you jumped to be federal criminals. Crow doesn't say, let's just give up and stay at Saffron and Tara's house forever. He says, stealing an airship is fucking dumb. Was this speech written by someone who hadn't seen the rest of the episode? We've been in bad situations before, and we didn't need an adult to come save us or tell us what to do. We just did it our way. Not only is Ruby's assertion of, we don't need adults to save us, just laughably wrong, but it's also the most confusing direction for her speech to go. Nothing has happened to prompt this idea of, the smelly adults never let us kids do anything. Like, it literally goes, steal an airship, that's dumb, no, I want to hear him out, you gave up but we haven't, kids can do stuff too. Like, just, how? <laughs> 
I'd also like to point out that Weiss, Blake, Yang, Ren, Nora, and Jean are all legally adults. By volume 6, the majority of the group are 18 to 19, and hell, even Ruby's 17 by this volume. Ruby's kids can do anything bullshit rings totally hollow once you remember that almost her entire adventuring party qualifies as adults. And I just don't understand why the writers decided to have Ruby give this kids rule speech. Well, I mean, I know why. It's because they replaced giving Ruby anything important to do all volume with having her give hollow speeches every other episode. But rather, the part I don't get is, why have the speech go in this anti-adult direction? Did they think this would help the group develop? Did they think it would make a meaningful impact on the audience? Or is it because this was a first draft that got used because they ran out of production time? And so, that was lost. Which is how I feel after watching this episode. Completely at a loss for how such a poorly made product was allowed to pass through the production cycle at Rooster Teeth. Some real shit must have gone down in the company for them all to be okay with an absolute waste of time being fully produced and released. Am I being hyperbolic? Yeah, a little. This episode isn't offensively downplaying PTSD or abuse. It doesn't feature the embarrassing, janky animation we've seen come from the show before. The characters are actually moving on screen, unlike the whole of Volume 5. And there isn't even Cinder in the episode to slowly wander across her lines. So I have to sit and ask myself, why am I such a whiny bitch about this episode? And I think it's being disappointed because it could have been a much better product. Clunky exposition, boring dialogue, lack of meaningful information given to the audience. M and Smirk's conversation is on par with all the lore talk of Volume 5, which is to say it's insufferably dull with no redeeming qualities offered by the direction or visuals. The first scene feels pointless and like a waste of time. And quite frankly, that's the same for every moment of the episode. Pyrrha statue and the red-haired woman just waste your time. Ruby talks at Crow without any good points to be made, and it just feels like a waste of time. The same clunky dialogue and lack of meaningful substance pervades the whole episode. The only difference is that RT really wants to pretend that having red-haired woman and Jean ham-fistedly tell us everything we already knew about Pyrrha is emotionally impactful. They gave a default-looking background character model red hair and demanded we be impressed. And the whole thing ends with the character with the most insufferable voice and performance giving a wandering, pointless speech, as the showrunners expect us to stand and clap for her taking charge. The characters all behave like know-it-all brats. The script is nonsensical. The visuals are about as engaging as watching grass grow. And it didn't have to be this way. And that's the worst part. Don't spend so long on characterless backstory with Emerald and Mercury. Don't spend so long on mysterious red-haired woman speaking with no emotion into camera. Don't spend so long on a speech with no point, because you know what we had to miss out on for all these shitty events to happen? Oscar developing on screen in relation to the main plot, and the resolution of two of your main characters settling an argument and begin to start the idea of dating. Yang and Blake were last seen at odds in the farm. There was conflict between them. The very next fucking episode after this has them flirting and giving each other bedroom eyes. Why did the writers decide to skip the middle of that arc, insistent on having the two start to date at the end of the volume, but you decide setting up the beginning of that relationship isn't as important as Jean crying about Pyrrha AGAIN? Oscar's the only member of this giant ass cast that's actually connected to the main plot, and after setting up his struggles with Ozma and his reincarnation, you decide letting the audience see the conclusion to that arc isn't as important as Jean crying about Pyrrha AGAIN. So not only is this episode just pretty poorly made, but in the overall context of the show and the story, this episode is a waste of time lingering on worthless subplots. The showrunner's priorities for this episode are out of whack. The main plot, the main characters, those don't matter. Waxing poetics about the only character with a meaningful death, that matters. Why? Because fan service will hopefully get the show popular again. And it's disappointing that the writers and directors thought that setting up development for the main character's relationship or exploring how the main plot actually affects the only character personally invested in it wasn't enough. To pander to the audience as opposed to give the audience a well-written, engaging new story. 
They linger so much on their past success that they hurt the emotional impact the current story could give. This episode infuriates me so much because we could have missed out on what could have been really emotionally charged, meaningful development for the story and cast, to instead spend the bulk of the episode on a throwaway character they modeled to sort of resemble a dead fan favorite, and considered that good enough. They expected praise for this episode, but failed to earn it. I literally started- you just texted me, by the way. Um, but I literally just started to record, and it started to rain. <laughs> so, I'm gonna take that as a good sign. <laughs> so let's do this. The majority of this next one is one sentence, because I'm bad at grammar, I guess, so... Let's see how well this goes. 